On this week's What the Ship, we have grain coming out of Ukraine for now. Russia says it won't accept an oil price cap. We have falling container volume, rates, and profits. We also have free-falling lifeboats off of cruise ships. And three Nigerians set sail on a rudder. Hi, I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this episode. Wow, <laughs> it's a lot to go over. So if you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our top five maritime stories for this week. So the first story takes us to the bulk market, particularly the, the export of grain from Ukraine to the rest of the world. As we know, this has been a very tenacious issue. This story right here from Bloomberg talks about this, that Cargill, which is the, one of the biggest food exporters in the world, resumes grain shipments from Ukraine. And what we're seeing here is really the coming down of prices. Now, this chart here is a really interesting one because this is the one I want to show you. Because a lot of people have been talking about the fact that, you know, hey, food prices have fallen tremendously. Let's remember, but food prices had absolutely went through the roof back in early 2022 with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. It is now stabilized, but notice it's at the highest level it's been since 2013. So even though food prices have come down, it's still at a remarkably high level. What we're seeing here is bulk vessels. These are the vessels designed to carry bulk cargo are in short demand. Go back to a big issue we talked about the other day. The market and age of vessels in the world are getting older and they're not being replaced very quickly, largely because of issues about what's the new fuel standard coming forward. And so what do we see happening? Well, you're seeing coal carriers, iron ore carriers, other bulk ships, what are referred to as dirty bulk ships, being cleaned out so that they can carry crops and grain for longer distance. This is a big change we're seeing. Usually you don't see these vessels swap out very easily, but this is being done now. So we're pulling ships from the ore and the coal trade to be able to carry more grain. That's because it has to be carried longer distances. So real big interest here on the movement in the bulk sector. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to story number two. Story number two deals with the Russian oil cap. I just did a video on this. I'll have the link in the show notes so you can see it right over here. Russia says it won't accept an oil price cap. This is shocking, uh, not at all, by anyone. It is not going to be unusual for Russia to absolutely balk at this. The issue here is that Russia is lowballing low oil out there on the marketplace like never before. What we're seeing here is Europe... Uh, the EU and the G7 have finally come up with a price cap, $60 per barrel. The problem is that that oil is being sold at lower than that. So the price cap really has no meat to it. The other problem is enforcement. I, for the life of me, don't understand how they're going to do the enforcement of this. Understand the way this oil price cap works is the 13 big protection and indemnity insurance clubs are basically being told not to insure any cargo over $60 per barrel coming out of Russia. And so the idea being that ships would sail without P&I insurance. This is the liability insurance on the cargo. And we've already seen some elements take place where Turkey, for example, as of December 1st, is requiring proof of insurance to go through the Turkish Straits. However, there's going to be a lot of workarounds on this. One of the things we're going to see is very much like we've seen with Iranian and Venezuelan oil evading sanctions from different countries around the world. We're probably going to be seeing Russians doing the same thing. Greg Miller over at Freightways had this story. Could Russian sanctions work in practice even if they fail on paper? The big issue here is that maybe it is the enforcement of this may not be possible by the agencies. Because again, if a P&I club does insure cargo over the $60 threshold, who's enforcing that? What's the mechanism that happens to that P&I club? It's not exactly clear what's going to happen. If a P&I club in Sweden or Japan or the United States or Great Britain does this and the cargo is insured, what, what happens to that P&I club? Again, one of the things that they're not doing is they're not announcing they're blockading and stopping ships carrying Russian oil. Understand that the EU and the G7 are basically boycotting, sanctioning 
Russian maritime oil as of Monday, December 5th. However, that doesn't mean it's going to stop flowing. It's still going to keep flowing, and countries like China and India and maybe Turkey, Middle East, who knows, Latin America, Africa, will be buying Russian crude oil. And again, one of the big things is is the G7 and the EU want basically to hurt Russia, but at the same time, not disrupt the global economy by cutting off Russian oil. And the problem here is, how do you get both of these things? And I don't think they do. So one of my follows on Twitter is E. Finley Richardson. I think it's a great follow on everything tanker market. And he just had a tweet just today. He was talking about, so you want to know how Russia will export crude oil despite sanctions? Look no further than Iran for how they have done it for years. And what he has here is an earlier thread, and I'll have a link to it in the show note for you. Basically, the flags of suspected vessels involved in transporting Iranian oil. And it is a who's who of open registries and really questionable flag states. These are states that are definitely ones that port state controls look at with a lot of suspicion. So there are ships out there. He goes on here to another post right here. Uh, Where there's a will, there's a way. Whose tanker will carry Russian oil? The biggest importers of Russian oil own 25.6% of the world's tanker fleet, 27% if you count Indonesia. They also own 31% of the world's chemical tanker fleet, which can double as product tankers. So, I mean, he goes in here and really identifies that fleet out there, and you can see it between China, Turkey, the Russian Federation, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, goes on down here to Malaysia and others. So there are tankers out there should they need it to transport, plus Russia is building up their shadow fleet. This is going to raise issues. If you start enforcing this and you start stopping ships carrying Russian oil, how does Russia react to that? What happens when the insurance gets canceled and these ships cannot offload? Story number three, the container industry. Greg Miller over at Freightways. Container shipping rates still sinking. No sign yet of market flaw. The skid slows for Asia spot rates to West Coast, but not to East Coast. This is a story from a few days ago where Greg is talking about the fact that we're seeing rates just continually to plummet right here. Here he has the indexes showing those freight rates coming down, and you see them coming down from earlier this year where they're way up here, talking about $15,000, and now down to $4,400. And so we're seeing those rates just plummeting downward. And that seems to be across the board. We're seeing it in volume, we're seeing it in rates, and we're also seeing it in the container line's profit. Right here, uh, Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, carrier results could fall up to 70% in the fourth quarter, according to Alpha Liner. Alpha Liner, who tracks all this kind of information here, is looking at these falls. It goes in concert with this story from Mike Schuller at G-Captain. Container shipping industry passes earnings mark. So John McCowan, uh, John does the monthly, quarterly uh, report on containers. It is a must read. Get on to John's LinkedIn page. Get on his mailing list. And what he has right here is the container shipping industry earned profits of $58.9 billion in the third quarter. That is 22.4% higher than the 48.1 million profits from last year's third quarter. It is 6.6 lower than the mine altering 63.7 billion. This is the record. Uh, earned in this year's second quarter, making for a slight sequential earnings downturn that is expected to continue in the months and quarters ahead. So what we've seen, if you look at a graph from prior to COVID, it's a nice kind of a little flat little line. And then all of a sudden it bobs up there for everything. This is container volume, container rates, and container profitability. We see it up there. Now we're seeing, we're seeing rates come down. We're seeing volume starting to come down. And we expect to see the profits start coming down. That's what we're expecting to see. Uh, this second quarter, 2022, was fantastic. Third quarter, still great. I mean, still record numbers we're seeing right here. Container lines have been absolutely profitable. However, that also means that they're ripe for some changes. From Lodestar, could MSC be mulling a 2M split? So the biggest alliance, there are three big alliances with nine top container companies. The biggest alliance is Maersk and Mediterranean Shipping. They control almost 35% of the world's 
containers capacity. They're both led by people named Soren, gave an interview over on Lloyd's List. And he was asked this question directly by Richard Mead. And uh, the answer he gave Richard was that MSC is in an alliance for a few more years. There's no plans to change the alliance right now. But MSC had bought nearly every container ship, secondhand vessel they can get their hands on. They bought ships like crazy. They have increased their capacity exponentially. But that also means they have a very old fleet. It's a fleet that is going to need to be updated. And they have assets to basically bleed off. The fear is that Maersk and MSC get too big. If they go over 40% of the share capacity on a service, there's a potential for uh, the EU, the United States, and even China to come at them with basically monopolistic, this cartel rules, and basically determine that they're operating to the detriment of, of fair competition. Yeah, even China can do that. And so it's unsure what's going to happen here. But what we are seeing is a lot of shippers, those who are shipping cargo, are reacting to the power of the big ocean liners. And we're seeing that in stories like this, where we're seeing the Federal Maritime Commission now has more than 175 charge complaints submitted against the ocean carriers under the Ocean Shipping Reform Act of 2022. That's a Mike Schuller story. So they're a pushback against the big ocean carriers. Remember, they've been making huge profits here, massive profits, just oozing money all over the place. And the question here is, can they maintain it? We just saw a sea intelligence report showing that the, the container lines are getting more reliable. This is the weird thing about ocean shipping. When they're in the most demand and they're getting the most profits, they're the least reliable. They will not make their delivery schedule. But when things slow down, they're much more reliable. And we're seeing that swing right now take place. Man, what happens with the ocean container market is really in a lot of flux right now. Because we keep comparing it to 2021 and 2020. And got to remember, again, 2020, 2021, and even the first three quarters of 2022 are record years. We have not seen levels like this ever before. We're coming down. We're resetting back to like 2019 levels. But again, when you come off this huge cliff and you drop down to the bottom, there's always that bullwhip effect. and You're going to pop back up again. Question is, where does this pop back up? And then what happens afterwards? Those are the big questions we got to be looking at. All right, let's go ahead and go to our next story about something in free fall. All right, story number four takes us to the cruise industry. And I got three stories here from the cruise industry I have to look at. So the first story I've been wanting to look at, and I just hadn't had a good place to put it, but this is the best place now for it. So this story over Thanksgiving, Mike Schiller wrote this at GCAB. Thanksgiving miracle, Carnival passenger rescued several hours after falling overboard in the Gulf of Mexico. If you heard this story, this is an insane story that this guy fell off a Carnival cruise ship treaded water for almost 20 hours and was eventually rescued by the Coast Guard. It was an absolutely phenomenal event. I mean, I mean, the guy is so lucky to be alive. However, I got to ask a couple of questions here. Number one, how do you fall off a cruise ship? Because I have to tell you, number one, it's not easy to do. If you've been on a cruise ship, you've ever been on one, the rails are designed so that you can't fall off. They, they really make it almost idiot-proof keyword, almost idiot proof for you to fall off a cruise line. Second, falling off a cruise line. Let me be clear how high up you are. Water is like concrete. When you hit it at a certain distance, how he survived the fall is even more amazing. I found this story over at on the Daily Mail because the Daily Mail is great. But you got to watch the interview. You There was an interview done with this guy and you have to watch the interview because it is too good. So first off, he's 28, claims he has no idea how he fell overboard from the Carnival Valor, but insists that he was not drunk, even though he can't say how many drinks he had to celebrate winning an air guitar competition. Has anyone ever in the history of the world won an air guitar competition who is sober? Seriously, anyone. Put in the show notes or put in the comment section. Let me know. And this guy survived 20 hours, 20 hours in the water. There is no way this guy was not drunk drunk off his ass i'm sorry there's no way and which makes me wonder how he survived that there is no way i mean no way that this guy was sober and fell overboard and not remember how you fall overboard 
So I, I think there's a lot going on with that story. Okay, that seems to be a really strange story when it comes to the cruise industry. Let's go to this next one. Quantum of the Seas lifeboat accident caught on video. So I, I, I've i talked about this before on previous videos. Matter of fact, one where there was a shipboard fire. So let me give you a little hint about cruise ships and lifeboats. So if you've seen the movie Titanic and everyone who ever goes on a cruise ship equates every disaster on board a cruise ship to Titanic. Very important. So when Titanic sank, there was this issue about how many lifeboats it had. And understand lifeboats back in that time were not intended for everybody to get in them. That's not what they were intended for. They were intended to get people off the boat and shuttle them over to neighboring vessels. That was the plan. That changed, obviously, with Titanic and when Jack and Rose died because Rose wouldn't let Jack on the on on the bed. You know that. He, he could have gotten up there, but no, Rose kept him off. Anyway, that's a whole different story. So now you have enough lifeboats. However, what you may not know is this, that supposedly when we first set this up, the idea was because of listing of the vessel, you're supposed to have enough lifeboats on one side for all the passengers. That's not the case anymore. This video is even more dangerous because it shows a unscripted release of a lifeboat. Now, let me be clear. If you have to abandon ship on a cruise ship, it's going to be pandemonium. Pandemonium. Look at everybody who's on a cruise ship with you and imagine getting them with a life jacket on in a fairly tight enclosed space that's going to be hot, sweltering and miserable for everyone involved and complaining. It's it's horrible. And then understand when these boats get lowered down to the ocean, it's not going to be calm. It's never calm when you have to abandon ship. I guarantee you that. But believe it or not, there is one handle there that's well marked. When you release it, it drops and releases the lifeboat from the falls. These are the, the, the wires that, that run down and lower it. What happens here is an unreleased uh, or an unscripted release of the lifeboat, as you will see. That was completely unplanned. Now, there are what's called freefall lifeboats. They're on ramps and designed to be released, but those uh, lifeboats have special seats in them. There are special ways that you sit in there and strap in. That's not a freefall lifeboat. That's a boat that's supposed to be lowered down the water. What probably happened is someone either accidentally tripped the release or the release was inoperable and broke and released the lifeboat. That's not good no matter what happened here. This is a terrible, terrible event to take place. But it gives you an idea of the danger of lifeboats. I mean, they're not really foolproof all the time. And while there are just enough lifeboats for the passengers on board, for the crew who don't get into lifeboats, there are life rafts. But understand, because of the size of cruise ships, the method of egress... Uh, to the life rafts is a bit of a challenge, I will tell you. I, I, I gotta say, I've never done this, but it looks kind of crazy. So you see the life rafts popping up. Look kind of nice inside. Crew members must come down the chute, and this is an experience they will not forget in a hurry. So, because you have to evacuate the vessel quickly, now understand when you get in a life ra a lifeboat. The lifeboat is up alongside the vessel. You climb into the lifeboat and then you lower it to the water line and you sail away. The life rafts, you drop over the side and now you have to get from the top deck down into the life raft. Now, they can use a ladder, but that takes a long time and you have to kind of get off the boat fast. So what they have are basically human straws where you jump down the chute and the chute basically kind of crimps your body up and the friction of that is what slows you down. Watch as the crew demonstrates. Yeah, he's yelling he's stuck. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's how you get somebody out. I, I don't know. What happens should a modern cruise ship have an issue where it needs to actually abandon ship? I mean, go back to Costa Concordia. You lost 32 people on a vessel that actually washed ashore. Uh, yet, if you have a modern cruise ship at sea, there is that danger. That brings us to the last of the trio of cruise ship stories in this block. 
Rogue Wave kills passenger on Viking's newest polar expedition ship. So one of the hottest cruising spots to go to, metaphorically speaking, is Antarctica. It's a place where more and more cruises are operating. And on November 29th, uh, Viking's newest uh, cruise ship in this area, the Viking Polaris, was hit by a rogue wave. And this rogue wave incident caused damage to the vessel, but it also caused the loss of life. And these vessels that go down to Antarctica are specially designed for this trade, for this service. You don't take one of the big, huge, massive uh, beasts down there because they're just too big for that. You can see the windows bashed in here where it took the wind, uh, the, the, the wave on its beam. I just want to talk about this for a minute because having sailed through the Drake Passage one time, I have to say, this is not a nice place to go sailing. Those of you who don't know, there are, there are, there's what's called the Southern Ocean now. It's been officially designated an ocean. So you get the Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and the Southern Ocean. What makes the Southern Ocean unique is that the Southern Ocean circumnavigates the globe. It circles all the way around Antarctica. There's nothing in its way to prevent it from basically going across. And what that means is that ocean is not impeded by uh, landmass and the waves, the, the rollers that come across there are huge. Some of the biggest seas you'll ever see. Now where this vessel encountered the problem was sailing from Antarctica to the southern tip of South America. Now, again, if you want to know the force of the ocean, just look at the fact that ocean and wind and waves bent two continents, South America and Antarctica. They physically bent them. And that vessel was heading northbound at the time. The wind and wave is always setting from the west to the east here, all the time, all the time. I know they say it's a rogue wave, but I have to say that this area is one of the worst places to sail in if you're going perpendicular to the wind and weather. That is the worst because what you're going to do is force those vessels to roll like crazy. And if you get a short roller or a longer roller in there, it's going to cause problems. You almost have to go back to the age of sail and almost tack through this area to avoid some of the, the waves you see. But because of schedules, cruise lines are in fixed schedules. They have to get to a port, offload a group and get a new group on board. That may have been a factor at play here. But I think it's really important to understand that a lot of injuries happen on these vessels that sail to Antarctica. This is not a cruise for, you know, people who are not used to mobility and getting around. It's not a smooth Caribbean cruise. This is a rough cruise. You're going from South America to Antarctica. It is not a nice passage through the Drake Passage. So be aware of that. Uh, again, I think it's just a, a, a prudent warning for everybody. All right, let's head to our last story, which is a, another doozy of a story here. So story number five takes us to the coast of Africa from Nigeria to the Canary Islands. This story from Reuters, stowaways rescued from ship's rudder after 11-day voyage. Yes, what you're looking at right here is three people sitting on the rudder of a vessel. A absolutely Insane. I, I mean, I can't even talk about how crazy this is. Uh, two of the three stowaways who were rescued in Spain's Canary Island after enduring 11 days on the rudder of a fuel tanker from Nigeria have been returned to the ship with the aim of deporting them. The third person who suffered hyperthermia and dehydration during the voyage has not been released. Uh, this is just you know, one of the things we talk about is stowaways. I, I hear about this a lot about stowaways on ships. A lot of people think that there is a big, huge, massive problem with stowaways on ships. The biggest problem with stowaways on ships are ships going short distances, uh, not long distances. Uh, I know you've heard that there are stories about people in containers all the time and having living conditions. Those are the exceptions. Those are very unusual and very rare. What you tend to have is people sneak on board vessels, crawl on board vessels, get into spaces on the vessel, hide on the vessel, and then when they get to a port, get off somehow. And in the case of Nigeria, people want to escape from Nigeria for obvious reasons. Very, you know, uh, it's unstable. There's a lot of death and destruction there. People want to get out. But getting on the rudder, 
I mean, again, what they're talking about is the idea that these guys rode on the top of a ship's rudder. Understand, the prop is right here. There's wash right here. The rudder moves. The ship goes up and down. I, I, I mean, now there is uh, where the rudder post goes into a ship. Sometimes there are seal areas in there where they can climb into. And one of the things that most people will do when they transit through areas like this is inspect vessels. And you always inspect vessels where there are openings to the ocean or to the outside for stowaways. So like your, your stern uh, steering compartment is always one you would always want to check for that. But the fact that these three guys rode that for 11 days gives you an idea of the magnitude of this. It, it's absolutely incredible. I've seen people take pictures on this, which I think is weird. Uh, they do it on this, on the bulbous bow, just some really crazy images. But this image, which was, again, this was taken by the uh, Spanish police in the Canary Islands just demonstrate how much people wanted to get out of this on 11 days at sea from Nigeria to the Canary Islands. Uh, it's just incredible. I, I just, I, I find it really hard to, to process and fathom. So there you go. Five stories across the maritime spectrum. Man, a lot going on. Uh, again, every week I keep thinking I'm not going to have anything to talk about this week. And man, it just turns the opposite way every time. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that, Sal? Easy. You can hit that super thanks button below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon, become a patron of the page. You can become a weekly or yearly subscri uh, subscriber to the page or monthly, uh, I should say, uh, subscriber, and you can help support the page by keeping it up and running. So until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.